Okay, well, it's 12 sharp. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Pearson. I'm honored to sort of uh, welcome you here in the name of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, I think we had already some questions on what is humanistic management, and I think uh, this conversation is a very good introduction to those that, that uh, are puzzled by that question. Um, humanistic management is the attempt to rethink how we organize in ways that honor our inherent value, the human value, but also the inherent and intrinsic value of our life, including that of a flourishing environment, so to speak. Um, though that's one pillar that we focus on. The other one is the creation of well-being within the planetary boundaries. And uh, if you are managing practitioners, you will probably see that this is rather unfamiliar uh, vocabulary. So what we're trying to do with these sessions and in the association is to build bridges across various audiences and help us formulate and create new vocabulary that can be helpful in moving us forward and addressing the large, big uh, existential problems that we're facing at this point. So I'm very honored and very excited to have Donna Hicks join us for one of the first calls where we're decidedly trying to establish and build out bridges to the practicing managers uh, along with those that are interested in consulting and working with uh, that group. And uh, for that matter, I'm very uh, honored to have Jennifer Hancock with us who's going to basically lead that kind of conversation. So I'm going to hand off. Welcome everybody here. Thank you for joining. And Jennifer, it's, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Michael. For people who don't know Michael, Michael's over at Fordham University and he's one, he's been helping to kind of push humanistic management within the field of academia for I don't know how many years now, several. Um, and there's an international association and uh, we're also trying to create a USA chapter. Um, he's actually known Donna Hicks. She said for about seven years they've done um, programs together on dignity. Um, and, and leading with dignity together. So uh, that's who he is. Let me introduce Donna. Donna is an associate at the Weatherford Center for International Affairs. She has been involved in numerous unofficial diplomatic conflict resolution efforts, including projects in the Middle East, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Colombia, Cuba, and North Ireland. She is the vice president of ARA PASSIS, an Italian organization sponsored by the Italian Foreign Ministry. They are currently involved in a dignity restoration project in Syria and Libya. She was a consultant to the BBC where she co-facilitated a television series called Facing the Truth which, with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, which aired in the UK and on BBC World. She has taught conflict resolution at Harvard, Clark, and Columbia Universities. Dr. Hicks conducts training seminars in the Dignity Model, a human-centered approach to rebuilding conflict relationships and to creating a culture of dignity in a variety of settings in the corporate world, healthcare, education, faith communities, and nonprofit organizations. She is the author of the book Dignity, Its Essential Role in Resolving Conflict, which was published in 2011 by the Yale University Press. And her second book, Leading with Dignity, is going to be published by Yale University Press in the next couple of months. It's currently available for pre-order at Amazon. Welcome, Donna. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jen. It's, um, you know, it's wonderful that we all have an opportunity to take this time you know, out of our busy days and just think together and reflect together about this um, fundamental aspect of our humanity and, and the driving force behind the humanistic management network, as Michael pointed out, you know, honoring the dignity of uh, people in organizations. It's a paradigm shift away from the old notion that you know, businesses are created to maximize wealth. And here what we're trying to, with the Humanistic Management Network, as you all, maybe some of you know, but certainly uh, Michael and Jen, that, um, and others obviously here too, but where we're trying to put the notion of human dignity at the center of this new and creative business paradigm, uh, where it really matters the way we treat people. So that's how I got connected up with the Humanistic Management Network. Um, and that's not where I began my interest in dignity. I've been uh, for 20, now 25 years um, at Harvard University. And um, I was the director of a program 
where we brought parties together in uh, international conflicts, the worst conflicts, the, the most intractable, Israeli-Palestinian and, you know, conflicts, in, as Jen pointed out, in Sri Lanka, Colombia, all over the world, where people were having a really tough time putting an end to their conflict. So I, I would, I first realized that dignity was a, actually a missing link in our understanding of why people got into conflict to, the, to begin with, and how um, indignity actually kept people apart and not recognizing that underlying all these political issues were, were unhealed and unaddressed wounds to, to their dignity. So anyway, very long story short, I wrote a book, the first book that Jennifer mentioned, um, Dignity is Essential Role in Resolving Conflict, to try to shed light on this, this, this idea that, look, when people are treated badly, they have a hard time letting go of that. And it, and it, you know, when I wrote, wrote the book, I wasn't thinking that, I was thinking mostly about my work in international conflict, but when the book came out, it was clear that other, you know, it touched a nerve in other, in other arenas, for example, in the corporate world and healthcare and all those places that Jennifer pointed out where I've been working, education. Um, and the interesting thing was that um, even though, even though people would, you know, obviously have conflicts in the workplace, up until the time that I introduced this framing that, gee, maybe, you know, maybe some of the problems that you're having are um, due to the same causal factors that I'm dealing with with an international conflict. So it was fascinating to see how people resonated to this idea of dignity being one of the causes of why they were having trouble, let's say, in the corporate world with management employee relations. And so I was asked to go in um, to this one major corporation, uh, 70,000 employees. They were having terrible, terrible management, was having a terrible problem with their employee relations. And I was asked by, um, I was asked by a senior vice president uh, to come in and see if I couldn't help, you know, figure out, maybe maybe just try out this dignity framing, see if there was any traction, see if it really resonated to the people who were engaged in conflict. And so what I, what I discovered was, yes, in fact, you know, dignity and dignity violations, violations of people's inherent value and worth were at the core of these, these, these management uh, employee relationship conflicts. So I ended up spending five years there at that project and I made one major mistake um, and it happened early on and I want to share that with you because even though the entire organization, um, people with whom I worked, the employees with whom I worked especially and, and management, even though that all agreed that um, this issue of dignity was underlying the problems in their organization, even though they all agreed, um, the problem was that the upper level management hadn't bought into this idea. And so I did work for five years, you know, inside working with one department then another department and all along and right from the very beginning, I realized that I, that was not a smart move because I realized that without the upper level management, really engaged in this and making a commitment to this, having buy-in to the idea that everybody in the organization needed to be treated with dignity. And if they weren't, um, all sorts of terrible things happened. You know, uh, productivity would decrease, employee engagement went down. Um, people were just resentful. And so uh, resentful of not having their grievances heard. Uh, and so I made that mistake I made, just underscore it here, is that I didn't go to the top leadership first. I really uh, was talked out of it by the senior um, VP of HR, and I, and I, I regret it, you know? I've, I've written about it before, and I, I really do regret that I didn't stick to my guns and say, we've got to start with you, executive leadership team, because here's the thing. What I found and there and everywhere else I've worked since is that the leadership teams are really, you know, they're good people. They're not bad people wanting deliberately to violate the dignity of their, of their employees. They're not bad people. They're just ignorant. 
They're ignorant of what it means, of how important dignity is in our lives. They're ignorant of the effects that, the toxic effects that um, being treated uh, as if you didn't matter, what that has on an organization. And, you know, I ended up realizing that we need to look at two levels when we want to initiate a dignity program in an organization. So no, number one, these executives were completely ignorant of, they've never even thought about the concept of dignity before, not to mention how it could be, how you could use it to analyze what the problems were within the company. They've never even thought of it. So the first, the first level that is important is, is having the leadership understand what these, how, how to honor dignity. It seems, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's even counterintuitive and it doesn't come naturally. So we need to learn this. You know, these executives needed to learn what it meant to lead with dignity. And by the way, just, just so you know, I have a very simple de definition of dignity. And that simple definition is, it's our inherent value and worth. And it's also our inherent vulnerability because our dignity, even though we were all born with it, and that's the very strong um, assumption that I, I work from, we were all born with dignity. But as I just said, we're not born knowing how to act like it. So we really need to, um, we need a big educational campaign in our organizations. Now, the other thing I wanna point out, because everybody always says, well, dignity and respect as if they're two, the same thing. It just comes out as if it's one word. Dignity is, I think, different from respect because, and I discovered this in my work in, in working with international conflicts. One of the things that happened all the time when I was having these dialogues back and forth with the um, intractable conflict, ethnic conflicts, was that people were clamoring for respect. They said, we demand to be respected. And I'm, I remember thinking, wait a minute, you know, I think you've got the wrong word here. I think what you should be demanding is to be treated as if you're a human being, to be treated with dignity, because that's really the, um, that's really the underlying problem here. And I think for those people in these intractable conflicts, it was a bridge too far to say, I'm going to, I need to, you know, I demand respect. First of all, you don't demand respect. Respect is something I believe is earned. So the difference between dignity and respect is that dignity, every one of us deserves it. We all deserve to be treated with dignity. Even when we mess up, you know, even when we make mistakes, we still deserve to be treated with dignity. And respect, on the other hand, I think it's earned. And I think, you know, when I say I respect someone, I, in my mind and in my heart, I feel, Oh, I want to be like that person. I'm, I so admire what that person has done. And so that's another key difference. In dignity, you don't have to do anything. You just have to be born to, to, to um, you know, to have your dignity recognized. But respect, I think we have to earn that. So this is, this is um, this foray back to the corporate world again, this foray into the corporate world showed me that even people with good intentions uh, can violate dignity, especially leaders who really want to do well by their uh, followers or direct reports. But the ignorance is encyclopedic. There is so much ignorance around the issue of dignity. They don't know what it is. They don't know, they don't know how, you know, concretely how to operationalize it to say, this is what it is. I came up with, in my research, I came up with 10 ways to honor dignity. There are the 10 elements of dignity. I don't know if we want to go into this now, but they involve identity, recognition, acknowledgement, fairness, uh, safety, um, uh, uh, giving people the benefit of the doubt, apologizing when you've done something wrong, and seeking deeper understanding. So all of these things, even though when, when, the, when the leaders look at these and they say, oh, yeah, this is, this, this is just common sense. Well, it's, not, it, it's common sense once you hear them. But uh, actually behaving in these ways is another matter altogether. So um, now, having made that huge mistake, not starting at the top when, um, when I go in and I'm asked to consult, now it's um, absolutely critical that my um, leadership team 
is, is conversant and has had experience with uh, what I call a dignity education project where they learn about the 10 elements. There's other, other building blocks of what I call the dignity model. So they are first and foremost, the first intervention I do with them is to explain everything about all the research that I've done, what dignity is, what it isn't, how to actually apply it, how to make it a way of life, and how to model it for people. Um, now, okay, so that's the first order of business. Now, the second order of business is looking at the systemic level, dignity at, from a systems perspective. So what I discovered in this first um, intervention that I did was that the leadership team, in their ignorance of all things related to dignity, ended up creating system-wide policy that not only well, didn't, wasn't about their interpersonal relationships and how they treated their employees, but it was about the policy that they directed that was, in fact, often policy that was filled with indignities that certain groups could have been violated um, by this overall, what I call dignity violating policy. So there's two, two orders of business. You have to work at the interpersonal level and at that systemic level, helping people uh, see the ways, maybe obviously they're often unintended consequences, ways that organizations um, and leadership, executive leadership teams make decisions that don't have what I call dignity consciousness at the forefront. So it's those, those two things you know how do we how do we get really good at treating each other nicely and as if we matter and secondly if we are in those decision-making roles how do we reflect on the um, policies that we create so those two things um, and if you want to if you want to and I'm almost done then we can open it up okay Jennifer so the other the last point that I wanted to make was that if you want to create a culture of dignity which means not just one particular department but the whole system is um, engaged in a what I what in in, in a, engaged and committed to making dignity the key central motivating factor in how people treat each other at work. So it's not just leadership with employees, but it's also employees to employees and, you know, all up and down the hierarchy. And so creating a culture of dignity requires that everyone in the organization is conversant in this dignity language and that they have had um, training. They've had, they, it, it's even before they, um, go to work the first day in their job, the first order of business is doing a week-long training in terms of, um, you know, how to promote dignity in the workplace, how to treat each other with dignity, and, and so on. A lot of skill building I do. So that creating the culture really does require everyone to be on board, even though the leadership really does set the tone, which is critically important, um, and everybody's responsible for the culture of dignity. It's not just the leadership. So, and the other thing that I've developed for people in organizations is something called the Dignity Pledge. And before you, <clears throat> before you um, sign on and become a member of this Dignity community, the whole organization uh, takes, well, not the whole organization, certainly the leadership creates a, a Dignity Pledge and all the employees have to sign it. They have to sign it to say that they were there trained in this concept of dignity and that they definitely do want to commit to taking their responsibility, whatever responsibility is in their hands, to promoting this, this culture um, that actually uh, encourages growth and development, encourages flourishing, as Michael pointed out in his intro, encourages a sense of well-being. And it's not just for the employees. There is a sense of well-being throughout the throughout the organization. And, you know, I even think that the organization has dignity and the behaviors that go on inside the, the organization reflect uh, largely on how people outside of the organization perceive the company. So, you know, people who get really great grades and great ratings for their company, um, uh, you know, with this dignity framing is, you know, it's an incentive. So it's not just 
internally, but it also in the relationship between the organization and the broader community too. So I'm going to stop there and let's see what people are thinking. Oh, that was so great. I was taking notes, but um, <laughs> I'm going to start with uh, one question and then we'll open it up to everybody else. And my question has to do with you know how to actually do this. Um, you talk in your TEDx video about you know, fail, you, know, you do this for a living and yet you still sometimes fail. So can you give me like three examples of practical examples in the workplace of what it means and how it looks when you actually, you know, apply dignity to problem solving and conflict in the workplace? And, and what do you do when you, you mess yeah. up? <laughs> so, so first of all, this is, for me, it's a lifelong um, challenge because and so much of what the dignity, the dignity model um, that I've created um, is based on is a lot of science about some of the underlying behavioral motivations and um, underlying science, the evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, about why we behave the way we behave. So just inherent in the human condition is this really dynamic tension between our desire to um, protect ourselves when our dignity is violated, the desire to uh, get rid of the source of threat as soon as we've been violated, and also, we also have, in competition with that, the inborn desire to be connected with other people, that inborn desire to, to have a loving connection, to have a really positive relationship with people. So, because human beings, this is, this is part of the learning, is what does it mean to be human? Because human beings do have this dramatic tension that we do protect ourselves and instinctively lash out at other people who lash back at us. We have to unlearn that response, you know, because fortunately we've evolved a neocortex that enables us to bypass some of those primal responses that all of us have within us. And so, you know, I, I tell people that some days I have really good days. I can get through an entire day without violating somebody's dignity. I, I'm just triumphant. And I mean, just yesterday, I had a really bad experience with my doctor's office. And I walked away from that thinking, oh, my God, you know, what, Miss Dignity, you know, what, how did you do well, Anyway, so I, I'm suggesting that this isn't as easy as it sounds, that if all of us sort of knew how to treat each other with dignity and, um, you know, didn't need an education around this stuff, then I think we'd see a very different world. The fact is we have a conflict-ridden world. I think there's an epidemic of indignity out there, and it's largely because we've ignored it. We haven't done the work that we need to do. And I too, you know, I mess up, as I said, every day. I told Jen yesterday that I have an organization up here in Boston called Dignity Violators Anonymous, and I'm the president. So I actually said that to one person in, in a talk, uh, in one talk, and afterward the person, another uh, uh, person from the audience came up to me and said, Donna, I want to sign up for that organization. Can I be? And I said, oh, I was just kidding. I'm sorry. But it's true. We all have this. We all are likely to mess up. And we're all, we have what it takes to actually do the right thing when we have the education, when we know how to do this. So I wanted to go back to your question about, you know, what happens in organizations and how do you uh, integrate this? I, I want to answer that by uh, you know, how do you, how do you actually address it? Um, I did a uh, survey in this big organization I worked with and subsequent ones as well and asked people to tell me, all right, of these 10 elements of dignity, which of the um, elements, which element do you think is violated most of the time in your organization? And in that big mega organ, the big corporation that I worked in, 80% of the respondents said that safety was the biggest violation. And, you know, I'm thinking, gee, maybe it's it should be identity or a sense of fairness, but safety came up. And, and in subsequent surveys, the same thing happens in organizations. And so it's safety in an interesting way. It's safety, not so much for your physical safety, but psychological safety. Because in follow-up questions to that, uh, those interviews, I said, oh, well, what, what do you mean you don't feel safe? And they say, we don't feel safe to speak up 
when something bad happens in, in my organization. So if my boss violates my dignity, oh my God, they say, oh, I just, I, I just, I don't have the guts or the courage to say something because, and I said, really, what? You wouldn't want to speak up? And they'd say, are you kidding? It's career suicide, speaking up to your boss about um, ways in which he or she has violated your dignity. And, you know, what about that promotion? I, if I stir up the pot here, I won't get that promotion. And I might even lose my job, worst, worst case scenario. So I was shocked by this. You know, I was shocked by that, um, those data and, and decided, well, gosh, we've got to do something about this. So the, and whenever I go in and people report this, no matter where it is, I always start the same way, which is, trying to figure out how to develop um, feedback skills with people. So again, if your organization has hired me and we have pledged to do this dignity work, part of the pledge is that when we inadvertently violate somebody's dignity, we're going to, we're going to be open to feedback. But talk about an undeveloped skill. Most people don't know how to, how to give that feedback. And in fact, most often when people give feedback, it's in the, it's in a very negative way. You know, they're angry, they're resentful, they're, you know, they use it as a weapon, the feedback as a weapon, rather than as an opportunity to learn something, to help the person and to accompany the person through a learning process, because, you know, we all have blind spots and we need the eyes of the others in order to see those blind spots, in order to hold up that mirror. So that is the first order of business, is helping um, them with um, developing these feedback skills. And it's not just how to give feedback, but probably equally as importantly is how do you receive feedback. And um, so that's the kind of work. And um, I mean, I, I've had such amazing success with this. And you, you think, oh my God, this is just crazy because it's so counter what we feel inside. You know, we're scared of that. Not only are we afraid of giving it, but receiving it feels so threatening. And, you know, so the question is, how do we give feedback in a way that helps people see their blind spots so that they don't get into the same kind of trouble um, in the work environment? And how do we receive it so that we feel it and that we can... Uh, take it in as something that's going to be useful to our own personal growth and development because we need each other for this. You know, because if you're in a leadership position, you may not see your blind spots, but everybody around you can see them. You know, people around you are experts in, in seeing and, um, and, and, you know, feeling and experiencing these, these, these violations. So setting up the ground rules uh, initially, this is why I said this whole culture of dignity has to involve everyone and everybody has to sign the pledge. Part of the pledge is I'm going to be open to constructive feedback. Um, actually, I call it feedback that promotes learning. I, I don't, constructive isn't enough, you know, it's feedback that promotes our, our personal growth and, and development um, and, and trying to override that powerful instinct to not want to hear it, you know, to, to, to resist it. Resisting feedback is one of these instinctive self-preservation tactics, so. Um, Elizabeth, I, th I, I know we have a lot of questions in the chat room, so can we, um, you know, start getting some of them asked and answered? Sure, um, I'm gonna focus first on some of the practitioner professional questions in the workplace. Um, so Georgia from Italy uh, asks, the company I work for got a really bad score on the great place to work survey. Yeah. Um, the only happy people were the top leadership. Uh, now they've added top management happiness managers, uh, but it's not working since they don't have the right training as Donna mentioned. How can solutions be promoted from a bottom up sort of way since employees are truly resentful and have trouble letting go? Yeah, well, that's the problem I walk into every single time I'm hired to do a consultation in dignity. The, the bottom level, the, um, the people who are affected by the ignorance of, of the top. And again, they're not bad people. I want to emphasize this, that 
Um, yet, the people who are the recipients of these dignity violations, you know, they can't take too many of them without building up a tremendous sense of resentment because it's, it's awful to be treated that way. And so bottom up, you know, I, I'll tell you what, I don't think bottom up works. I think, you know, if there's, again, that's why I say I made that huge mistake the first time I went into that corporation, that if the leadership isn't on board, it's going to be exceedingly difficult. And then there will be people, let's say people at the bottom, if they're not, the leadership isn't on board, people at the bottom will be targeted, you know, they will be, first of all, they won't be believed, they won't be acknowledged, because the, the, the consciousness isn't there to receive such grievances. So um, I, I feel really bad for uh, is it Georgia. Yeah, for Georgia, because um, I don't know if she can if she can get any uh, the ear of anybody at the top and um, and actually, you know, introduce this idea that maybe, you know, just maybe the, the employees um, see things that the top leadership doesn't see and to have them think about uh, integrating a dignity, you know, program into their, I don't know how big the, the, the work setting is that George is in, but honestly, I think the best thing that, uh, I'm assuming that Georgia may be on the outside, maybe a, a practitioner being hired to, to help with the problems or, you know, an outside third party. Uh, I would just introduce this idea because it's so interesting how, how people at the top um, react to this dignity education and react to having their consciousness raised. It's so funny because they end up telling me all the time about the multiple ways in which they have had their dignity violated in the organization. And so it's just remarkable how um, people feel their own dignity violations first before they understand how they're perpetrating it, you know, onto others. So I would, I would just, if she, if Georgia is a, a third party here, um, comp, you know, consultant that maybe to, you know, begin open up that conversation with the top leadership. Um, and now we have a question from Leanne and she says, I have a concern with everyone signing a pledge rather than just making it the way we do things. I have been asked to sign an ethics pledge because the senior managers had violated laws and ethics, and I felt insulted that I had to prove my integrity by signing something since somebody else wrote and was, uh, they were, she was forced to sign it. Well, this is a little bit different um, because the pledge is more specifically about you know, pledging to, try, you know, to honor the dignity of people in, in this very specific ways, and the pledge to, as I said, to, to give feedback, uh, to be open to feedback. And, and again, it's, um, um, it's more about what per everybody's responsibility is. And, and, and with Leanne, I know that's a terrible, I've, I've been in situations where people, have, you know, what she's described as her experience and, um, there's nothing worse than seeing top leadership get away with things that you yourself wouldn't be able to get away with. So the pledge is more, and, and again, the pledge is something that's developed system-wide. It's not just the leadership who develops this pledge. You know, it's discussed, it's, um, what's the word, um, like um, adapted to your particular, um, your particular department and the, the work that you're doing and um, I, I I have one. I have an example in, um, in my new book, uh, Leading with Dignity. There's a chapter on the Dignity Pledge, and uh, I hope maybe Leanne uh, has a chance to see that when it comes out, because it's, um, it's all pretty much described uh, in, in there. And how it, it's really, um, you know what it is? It's a, the Dignity Pledge is a um, uh, safety net, not safety, what's a check and balance? It's a check and balance against our worst selves, right? Against what we are, you know, trying to um, promote. And like she said, why not just make it a way of life? Well, you can't make it a way of life unless people have their consciousness raised first about how important it is. And there's something about working through that pledge and 
realizing that um, this is really important, you know, and I'm going to take this seriously. And even part of the pledge you can put in, I mean, every company does his, its own uh, version of the pledge. I just gave one example. But, you know, if people are nervous about something the way Leanne described, then that can go in there too. You know, it can be adapted, as I said, to any situation that, or any department or any set of grievances within an organization, within the department, so. Um, next, we'll move to a question from Maria. Um, she wants to know, can a dignifying workplace be achieved through the well-established practice of empowerment or employee empowerment? Is it enough? Well, again, um, what I find unique about uh, the dignity framing is that it spells out very clearly what it looks like to have people's you know, to have your dignity honored. It's very specific about what it looks like to, um, to have your dignity violated. It looks, it's very um, clear. It's a very clear picture of what these behaviors look like. And empowerment is certainly part of the dignity consciousness because you want people to feel empowered to speak up on their own behalf, you know, whether it's around sexual harassment, whether it's around everyday dignity violations where you feel like you might not be included in something you, so it gives people the language um, uh, dignity that that's a framing, that's a framing that involves an understanding of what the human experience is all about. And so, you know, definitely empowering people to claim their dignity, you know, to, to if they, oh, here's the other thing. Um, I don't know if Maria was, thinking about this but the other thing is that when I go into an organization the first thing I do is bring to light the notion that everybody has dignity and that everybody is worthy that everybody is deserving to be treated well and this comes out of I mean this was, this is usually a shocking first entry uh, into the organization that people don't really know they don't they don't, maybe they don't believe that they have dignity. Maybe they believe that they don't have inherent value and worth. And, but the fact is, we do, you know, we do. We are just born worthy. And um, getting people on board with that, um, that truth and that truth about the human experience is absolutely critical. So, you know, the, the, the dignity framing, I, I see it as a unifying factor that can help People in organizations, no matter where they, we are in the world, it, it, it goes beyond culture, it goes beyond diversity, it goes beyond all of those usual things that we do to promote, you know, a well-being and a culture. This is a unifying factor and empowering people to um, claim their dignity. I'll tell you that that is, that is my first job because so many people are plagued with self-doubt. So many people are plagued with the sense, oh, am I competent? Can I actually do this job? Are my workers going to see, you know, are they going to see that um, I'm having trouble here and am I going to get fired? One of my colleagues up here, um, Bob Keegan, has this notion, he's a, he's a developmental psychologist, and he has this idea that when people go to work, they are actually doing two jobs. First job is their actual job, what they were hired to do. But the second job is covering up their incompetence, hiding, hiding from looking um, not worthy, hiding from feeling like, oh my God, uh, if, I, if they really know how out of it I am here, they'll never you know, let me keep my job. And, and he believes, because he's a consultant as well, and he believes that you know, that's even the harder job. The harder job is this, what he calls hiding from your own sense of unworthiness. So we have some problems here, you know, and Maria's uh, correct that in empowering people is definitely uh, a part of the dignity approach. And I would say that it's even an umbrella concept. It's even bigger than empowerment because there's so many other ways that people have experienced wounds to their dignity that isn't, um, you know, um, that the antidote of empowerment would actually help, you know? So, but empowerment is fabulous and we have to have it. And I think this is just a broader, a broader framing, the dignity framing. 
Um, now I'm going to combine two questions that are related to each other nicely. So Jody wants to know what in your experience are the most common ways that dignity violations occur in corporations? And then Justin asks, how does an organization deal with accountability and justice for indignities that have transpired? Um, especially if the, they're not illegal indignities, but just yeah. moral. Everyday indignities, I call them. Everyday indignities that we all endure. So Jody wants to know um, the common ways that um, people have their dignity violated. Was that it? Yeah, what do you see most commonly in the workplace about yeah. how people are? Well, the safety one, I just reported, 80%. But also people get really upset with have, being treated unfairly. If they think that the policies that come down from the top uh, favor one group over the other. or So the, the business of fairness is, is huge. Um, identity. There are some people, I mean, I always go into an organization and there are always gender issues. Always, always, always. Um, and so gender inequity mostly, you know, where the men are getting the better jobs and, and more pay and gender equity around all those things that we know about. Um, and let me see, I think often um, a failure to be understood is a, is a big one. People, people want to be understood. And when we rush to judgment about people, especially if the environment is a little toxic and dysfunctional, you know, the idea of giving people the benefit of the doubt that, well, gee, maybe I better seek deeper understanding. Maybe, maybe I better go ask so-and-so about why she did what she did. Maybe, maybe there's something I don't know. Um, so that it was also a big one. Um, Acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is, huh. I think if, if acknowledgement, people, when people have suffered an indignity, when people have been treated badly, they, they want acknowledgement for the suffering that they've endured. And this is a, the other thing about acknowledgement. Most, most people don't know how to do acknowledgement. It's, I mean, I, I went into an HR department and asked, um, the, this HR professional, who was a wonderful woman, asked her if she would mind role-playing an acknowledgement uh, exercise with me. And she said, oh, sure, yeah, yeah, we, I, well, you know, she did it, and it didn't work. And so all of these things, like what it means to give feedback, how do you acknowledge, how do you show recognition for people, um, all of these things, even though we think we know how to do this, they require some skill building. They require some practice. They require practice. So those are some of the common ways. And nobody has apologized to. That's the thing. The last element of, dig of, of dignity that I have on that list of 10 elements is, is accountability. And people have the hardest time apologizing. And I know this. I mean, I'm guilty of this too. You know, if you're having this dispute with someone and you know the person's right and um, it's just so hard to get that, I'm sorry, and I, you know, I shouldn't have done that. It's so hard to get that out of your mouth. So people said, when I asked them, does anybody ever apologize around here for, you know, violating the, they say, are you kidding me? Apologize? No. So, and because in these toxic environments, it tends to be competition. You know, there tends to be a very competitive spirit where, um, if I am nice to this person, well, maybe, you know, he'll take advantage of me. I mean, that's the, that's the mindset. You know, if I really promote this dignity treatment and, and you know, try to create this in my work environment with my, um, with my fellow colleagues or with my direct reports, and aren't they going to just take advantage of me? And so anyway, that, that kind of competitive, competitiveness is what the culture of dignity tries to um, eliminate, you know, uh, and, and to open up the doors, to give people more space to make mistakes, to give people more space to be understood. It just opens up a space that isn't there with this competitive environment and with, um, you know, with this fear, this profound fear of looking bad in the eyes of others. And, you know, the second job, you know, the, the second job that Bob Keegan talks about. So, and Justin, I'm sorry. Oh, Justin talked about accountability, right? Um, 
well, I think I sort of covered that, you know, it, it, Justin, if I didn't cover it, um, let me know. But I think it's very hard. Oh, justice and accountability. That's what, that's what Justin said. Okay, so Justin, what I have discovered is that in or, this organization, uh, many of the organizations uh, where I went in to do co consulting work had some intergroup conflicts. So, for example, there was some, an IT group that was in um, a conflict with the customer service people, and um, they didn't know, the, the, the person who was the director of this, of this department didn't know how to resolve this conflict. And so um, I set up what I call dignity dialogues, uh, where people have an opportunity to talk about the ways in which their dignity had been violated. Um, it's a whole, this is another chapter in my new book about how to set up dignity dialogues, but good, you know, people who have endured these dignity violations at work need to have a process and need to feel that this isn't going to happen again. I need to be able to go to my manager or my supervisor or my HR um, person and say, look, I, 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 we, we need to have a process here. So these things typically, you know, typically, not always, but typically they don't get addressed in the, in the way that the people feel like they had had justice and that they, the people responsible were accountable. And, but, you know, I don't take a punitive approach to accountability. I don't know if any of you are familiar with restorative justice practices, but I think the goal in these dignity dialogues is not to, you know, shame the person who's done the dignity violating. But again, the goal is to reconnect the relationships. The goal is to try to heal the wounds of the relationship that the dignity violations caused. So restorative justice does a beautiful job with this. And, and justice, I don't know, Justin, if you were thinking more broadly in terms of justice, but from a dignity perspective, restorative ju I mean, um, justice is about restoring the dignity of the relationship as well as of the people who were engaged in the um, in the conflict so it's not punitive shame doesn't do it shame shame doesn't doesn't take care vengeance doesn't work as justice so anyway there you have it um elizabeth i think we got about 10 minutes left so one more question and then i have a question i'd like to wrap up with so Okay, uh, we'll go with Jay Capitano, uh, who is asking, are there individual differences in dignity? Um, do some people experience more dignity violations than others in the same situations? Well, so back to my primary assumption that is that everybody is born with dignity. And um, there is no scale about the importance of um, people. You know, I am, we have this new royal baby that was just born, you know. I want to be careful that we, we don't think that that little royal Louis, his sweet name, that he isn't um, any more important than any of our children, right? Any of our babies that get born. So we, we're, we're born with dignity. And um, what happens, unfortunately, I mean, there's a whole section in my book about this too, that kids need to have their dignity mirrored back to them growing up. So one of the things I do when I have a slide, um, I mean a PowerPoint in presentation, I show a picture of this beautiful infant baby and say that, look, you know, we can see how vulnerable this child is to um, needing caretaking that protects him physically, but our dignity needs protection and nurturing just as much growing up as our physical well-being. So, um, so if, if people have endured, uh, you know, had been the, if, if people had been the unfortunate recipients of really bad, bad parenting and they've had their dignity violated consistently, I think they will be quicker to, um, to quicker to vi have their dignity violated because it's so tender and because there really is no way to, to heal from those without having some adult attention on them. So I think that is, that is true that people, and the other thing is that people who have endured a lot of dignity violations in their young lives also end up becoming more perpetrators. They, they violate dignity a lot. So it's really hard, you know, when you're in the midst of, with someone 
who is a big dignity violator, it's hard to try to imagine that person as a little one and how many dignity violations he has endured or she has endured. So, you know, we got to dig for that dignity with people like who have had chronic violations of their dignity because they don't know they've got it, right? And part of their lashing out is in response to their feelings of unworthiness. So this is why I say the first order of business is usually to get people to accept their own dignity. But the other thing I wanted to say, Jay, about your good question was that um, I make the point in um, work when I work with people that even though the leadership team is, has a lot of the power and makes the decisions that affect your lives, that you may not be equal in status with people on the higher, uh, in the higher realms of the hierarchy, but you're equal in dignity. And so that's the difference there. But even though you have the power, and I say that people in positions of power are even have more responsibility for recognizing the dignity in others because they have that power, right? And they can do harm to people without dignity consciousness. And this is why, you know, I, I say it's a huge responsibility. Leading with dignity is enormous. And, you know, oh, I got to tell you this um, uh, story about, um, I was out in Los Alamos a few weeks ago in uh, New Mexico doing uh, some dignity training with the, uh, some of the people there, and they're fabulous people, wonderful, wonderful physicists, engineers, you know, and they, um, I was giving this talk, and they were, I was thinking about how much time they spent, these leaders, these, you know, in this low self, in this laboratory, how, I was thinking about how much time they spent getting their PhDs, getting their uh, postdocs, getting their fellowships that are specific, to, the, to their job, and I said to them, you know, if you spent a fraction of the time learning about dignity that you spent getting all these advanced degrees, I said, you would see a culture shift in this organization just like that. So, so the thing of it is, you know, people really do need to pay attention to it. We need, um, we need to make a commitment to it. We need to, we in leadership positions, it's, it's an awesome responsibility. And we have to live up to that responsibility. And, you know, so anyway, I know Jen had a question, so I would want to be sure she gets it in. Oh, okay, thank you. This has been really great. Um, the, the question I have, uh, I think it touches on one of the previous questions, which is, it, it had to do with the bottom up question. Um, we all, dignity is an issue with everybody we meet throughout our lives, whether it's people we're meeting at the supermarket or people in the workplace, how do we as individuals, not necessarily in a corporate context, but as individuals in the corporate context and also in the social context, how do we practice this? Um, you know, are there like three, three ways we can tweak our thinking so that we can actually do this and recognize it in ourselves? And, yeah. and how, do, how do we actually if we're committed to recognizing the dignity of the people around us, how do we actually do that? Like three, three takeaways. Okay. You sure. I can't do 20. No. <laughs> three, three. Uh, is, three I'm, is I'm a good person with the role of threes. I think I can handle three. <laughs> three, is good. three is good. Okay. Well, first of all, as a human being, let's say as a human being, as an individual human being, what is our responsibility and what can we do? You know, what can we do to improve our skills? Um, well, the first thing, is to recognize our own dignity. Number one, recognize that we have inherent value and worth. Oh my God, I gotta tell you a quick story. I think I have time to tell you this. When I was working with um, uh, Desmond Tutu in Northern Ireland, we were bringing together these victims and perpetrators for um, dialogues of the North, Northern Irish conflict. And um, one of the, the few days before the event started, we had team building meetings. and. He said, and we just getting to know each other and, you know, what our assumptions were about the work and so on. And I remember saying to him, well, um, Archbishop, the, um, you know, I know dignity is important here because the people with whom I work all over the world say that they feel like they've had their dignity stripped. And so I said, I have a feeling that, you know, we are going to hear this in, in our dialogues here. And he looked at me, he gave me this 
the scrunched up face looked at me and said, what are you telling these people? I said, what, what? And he said, are you, he said, nobody has the power to strip us of our dignity. Our dignity is in our hands and our hands only. And he says, don't perpetuate that myth that other people have the power to, you know, rob us of our dignity. And so, oh my God, I was just, I'm so embarrassed, right? And, and so he said, how do you think we got through apartheid? How do you think we black South Africans managed to keep our heads up when, you know, we were being treated as an, like animals? And he said, it was our dignity. And so that's what I, you know, that to me was the biggest eye-opening um, consciousness raising uh, experience that I think I've had around dignity. Recognizing that our dignity is our greatest resource. It's a tremendous source of resilience. It keeps us going when something bad happens to us. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, our dignity is in our hands and in our hands only. And that it can be wounded. You know, as I said, dignity is about vulnerability as much as it's about power because it's the precious power that enables us to, to actually um, stay upright when somebody assaults our dignity, which also he said needs to be cared for. So recognizing that, uh, that we have our, our dignity in our hands and our hands only. And I think we'd see a very different human uh, world, uh, interactions in, in, in the world if, if everybody actually did embrace their dignity. And, you know, I came up with this line that our dignity, uh, or that we may be betray our dignity, but our dignity will never betray us. So that's number one. Number two, um, recognizing our ignorance around dignity matters. Recognizing that we have neglected this for so long, and that we have to, as I said earlier, make a commitment, learn this. And those of us who are accompanying other people you know, through their own growth and development, whether it's through coaching or whether it's through, you know, working in HR or, or helping with conflict resolution. Um, if we don't have these skills and if we don't have this consciousness, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to, uh, you know, get to the core of the, this profound dignity human issue. So we have to have the language, we have to have the, uh, the skills. Um, so, and, and so the third thing is recognizing, um, obviously, the dignity in others and recognizing that our inherent worth um, is no different from the inherent worth in, uh, of other people. And, you know, I've, I've added to this other, this other factor, you know, we've got ourselves, ourself and our ignorance and also extending this dignity to other people. Um, you know, it's also extending the dignity to something greater than ourselves too, whether it's the natural world or, you know, people who are religious who think have a con conception of, of God, the creator. We have, to, we have to have a sense of humility about, um, about our self-importance because our, you know, once we have humility and know that other people's dignity is just as important as ours um, and that we have a responsibility also to the planet, to the uh, dignity of our shared universe, and to you know whatever, however you want to think about that larger, greater good, um, the dignity of the greater good. We have a responsibility. All of us has a responsibility. Makes me want to weep really to think about how big this job is that we, those of us in the humanistic management network. Michael is working. Michael and others. Uh, Jen, work. And Erica's here. Um, working just tirelessly to try to promote this sense of dignity and raise that awareness. Um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm in awe of uh, how much work we have to do, but I'm also in awe of the people who have made a lifelong commitment to this. All right, great. Um, I just want to remind everyone that Donna's book comes out in the next couple of months and you can pre-order it at amazon.com and it's going to be a fascinating, oh, okay. absolutely fascinating read. Um, Donna, do you have any final thoughts on, um, on for you, the importance of how you apply humanistic approach to your work? Well, when I go into the corporate world, it's the first thing I talk about. It's the first thing I talk about how, 
important it is to shift this dynamic from maximizing, you know, the focus being on maximizing wealth um, to maximizing our understanding of how to promote human dignity. Because here's the thing, if we're going to lead people, we better understand them. And understanding that human dignity is a core concern with everybody. And once we, we learn to honor the dignity of others and ourselves and to the greater, the greater world around us, once we do that, uh, these cultures, the toxicity and the dysfunction in these culture, cultures will eventually shift and we'll have that, not only the new paradigm, but we'll have the new experience of what it's like to be in relationship with others. And, and how do you answer the question of, um, well, if we're focusing on people, we're not focusing on making money, you know, how do you address that? Well, first of all, I mean, Michael hates it when I say this, but I mean, the fact is the research has shown that when, um, I, I'll tell you why he hates it in a second, but what the research has shown that when people make the shift to fo the focus on human dignity, that profits increase, um, employee engagement increases, productivity increases. So big surprise, right? When you treat people well, they go out of their way to, um, to do well for the company. I mean, big surprise. All of us know this. So, but I, what Michael hates about it is we don't, that's not why we want to promote human dignity in the workplace so that they can get profits, you know, that their profits are, won't be affected. No, we want to, we want to promote human dignity because it's the right thing to do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, to everybody listening, uh, we have other events coming up. Uh, we do host Necessary Conversations. We have a PhD network. Um, Erica, do you want to kind of unmute yourself and give people a list of the upcoming events? Sure. Um, well, our next Necessary Conversations is coming up on May 11th with Sandra Waddick and Jim Walsh. Um, and that's in terms of you know, work, research, and our work um, in, in management in organizations that lead to a better world. So that's our, that's our upcoming event. We're working on the next one for June, but May 11th at noon. And um, this is all up on the website. So please RSVP and join. We look forward to having you. Great. And as far as the professionals, this, this professional lunch and learn that we just did, we have uh, gotten Richard, uh, Jer excuse me, Gerald Wagner, who uh, has the cultural ambassador program. He's promised to um, meet with us at the end of May. I think it's May. It's a Friday, <laughs> May 25th, I think. So we'll be doing this again then with him. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming on. And thank you, Donna, so much for uh, helping us learn about dignity. You're welcome.